being a journalist is a lot of fun. Not only fun, but a lot of it it's fun. It's you meet interesting people, you go to interesting places, you do completely absurd things, all in order to find out what's going on and then tell everybody about it. It's like a, a license to be a gossip. You stick your nose into other people's business and then you tell as many people as you can. And I loved it. I, I'm hugely curious about everything. And for my entire adult life, somebody paid me to go off and be curious and ask questions of people. And I enjoyed it. I had an absolutely wonderful time. You're very modest about it. You say that you keep expecting to be found out and you feel that really it should have been somebody else all this time. Why do you say that? Because I know how thin was the ice that I was skating on. A lot of the time I was reporting on things I knew very little about, which perhaps I'd only started researching a couple of days before I jumped on a plane to go off to wherever it was. I know how easy it is to get things wrong, how difficult it is to get things right. I did get things wrong, of course, everybody gets things wrong, but on the whole, I was lucky that the things I got wrong were relatively minor, relatively unimportant. I never fell through a hole in the ice. Tell that to the ambassadors of Azerbaijan and Armenia. Well, that was rather unfortunate. I was uh, relatively early in my BBC World Service career. I was interviewing one after the other, the ambassador of Azerbaijan and the ambassador of Armenia, whose two countries were at war with each other at the time. They both had very long and unpronounceable names, and I started interviewing the first of them. And after, I think, the second or third question, there was a brief pause at the end of the line. He said, I think there is a mistake. I am the ambassador of Armenia, or Azerbaijan, whichever it was, but I'd mixed them up. And uh, it was a pity, and I shouldn't have done it. Was but that live? It was not live, thank goodness. You've been a, a reporter and a presenter, but you have really done your time um, learning journalism from the bottom up. You were with Reuters, you were in Rome and London and Paris, you were a war correspondent, you were a Middle East correspondent, you've done everything on the way. Did you enjoy all of it? Oh, gosh, um, quite a lot of it. I mean, the things you don't write about in books are the weeks and weeks of boredom and of frustration and of feeling, I wish I was doing something else. The horrendously long hours, the lack of sleep, the grotty hotels, the missed flights, all of that stuff, intensely frustrating. And uh, when I was writing the book, I was looking back, I still have a file, going back to my Reuters days, which includes all the angry messages I sent to head office in London when I was working in overseas bureaus about stories they'd spiked about stories they'd rewritten and inserted errors into, about things they'd got wrong, about places they hadn't sent me to. It was full of frustrations, of course it was, but always I had to remind myself that I was having a wonderful time in between the bits of boredom. But you know, I mean, I'm, I'm glad you point out that I, I, I put in the hours, as it were, because when I became a BBC presenter, I did feel that one of the reasons I was able to keep on top of the ice and not fall through it was that I had got the grounding. I had done the hard slog. I had been to a lot of the places where stories were. I knew what they looked like. I knew what they smelt like. I'd, I'd done the hard work. You have interviewed some of the world's greatest leaders and in a way it's like a focus group. You've had this privileged opportunity to compare and contrast. Do they have anything in common? It's quite interesting. I, when I started getting the opportunity to interview world leaders, I, I did kind of say to myself, I'm going to see if they have anything in common with each other. Um, Nelson Mandela and Hugo Chavez don't immediately seem to have anything in common with each other. And what I discovered was that they do, with very few exceptions, have a certain sort of presence about them. Now, partly that's to do with the office that they hold. They're surrounded by flunkies, there's a protocol, they're presidents and prime ministers. But they have a charisma. On the whole, they're quite good at relationships. They know, on the whole, how to play the media game. They know, I'm an interviewer, I need something from them, but it's to their advantage to play that game because they have a message they want to get across. The one real exception was uh, President Museveni of Uganda. He is still president after 30-something years. And uh, he had obviously been told that it was a good idea to do an interview for the BBC. 
I'm not sure he agreed. He made it perfectly clear that this was not something he wanted to do, that he enjoyed doing. He did it with bad grace. He gave very short answers. Uh, and the sooner he could get rid of me, the happier he would be. With that exception, most of the men, and they were all men, that I interviewed were powerful, charismatic, interesting. I mean, even Chavez, who was not a nice man and did terrible things for his country, had a certain charm to him. And I think it would have been wrong of me not to reflect that. And what was it like meeting Nelson Mandela? Well, it was, um, it was wonderful, of course, but it was a bit nerve-wracking. He was a great man, and I knew he was a great man, and he knew he was a great man. We did the interview in Johannesburg in his office with his wife, Grassa Michelle. It was a joint interview, and for some reason, which I never discovered, it was being recorded not in Johannesburg, but in London, which meant that it had to go via satellite. Satellites don't always do what you want satellites to do when you want them to do it. And I'd been told that Mandela had a very short window of time. We were going to be given exactly 60 minutes of his time in order to record a 60-minute programme. So he would come in, sit down, do the interview. End of 60 minutes, he would get up and walk out. For 20 of those minutes, I was waiting for the satellite feed to be established. Small talk, chit-chat. He was polite, gracious, but you could see that he was watching the hands of the clock tick tock and I was in a cold sweat because I knew I had to get an hour's worth of material out of him. Eventually we got the satellite feed, eventually we did the programme and I went over our allotted time and he was very nice about it but it was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences I have ever had. It really was seriously, seriously stressful. So you earned your money that day. <laughs> what did you talk about? Well I was very fortunate that shortly before flying out to Johannesburg, I had met uh, here in London an old comrade of his called Dennis Goldberg, who had been the only white defendant at the Ravonia trial, who had been with Mandela on Robben Island, and who had been the first of the Ravonia defendants to be released. And I had met him here in London, so I was able to say to Mandela, oh, by the way, I saw your old comrade Dennis Goldberg the other day, and his eyes lit up. Oh my goodness, how is Dennis? Tell me, you know. And so we did all of that, and that was nice. I'd been to South Africa the previous year with a local youth orchestra that my children at that time both played in, so I was able to tell him a little bit about their visiting the townships and all the rest of it. But boy, it was a long 20 minutes. Your style as a presenter is not as a Rottweiler, is it? You're not a John Humphreys or a Jeremy Paxman. You're more probing in your approach. Um, I, I think the phrase I use in my book is that I prefer the scalpel to the, 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 the machete or something. Um, it's not who I am. There was a time in the 1990s when I did become quite Rottweiler-like. When the John Major government was falling to bits, uh, it would have been remiss of any journalist not to point out that they were in serious trouble. And I remember many interviews I did with ministers at the time, which were fairly acerbic and fairly sort of tough interviews. I did an interview, actually not that long ago, with William Haig about, oh gosh, it was about the tax status of Michael Ashcroft, which at the time was a huge story. And there was one thing that I was determined to get him ad to admit. And I just, I did the Paxman. I just hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered until eventually he admitted it. And that was one, one to Lustig. You seem to start from the premise that politicians are lying to you. Is that always the case? Politicians do lie. That's a truth. Uh, they may lie for good reasons, but they lie. Not always, and not all of them. But the job of the journalist is to get through the lies, or to point out to people that they are lying. Um, so one can you think of an example of when you've been clearly lied to? Yes, I can think of an example. Um, Cecil Parkinson was a former chairman of the Conservative Party, a former senior cabinet minister, and after he had stood down, but was still a prominent Conservative, word reached us uh, at Broadcasting House from Westminster that he was going around saying very rude things about a successor minister in a department which Parkinson himself had once served in, and that he was prepared to say so on air. So we booked him. It was a good story. He came into the studio and off we went and he said exactly the opposite. Paid 
great tribute to this wonderful successor minister who was doing such a great job. And I was a bit puzzled. And at the end of the interview, he said to me, off mic, sorry about that, Robin, but I just felt I ought to give him a bit of support. So you've been completely set up? Completely set up. We threw it away. I mean, we didn't run it because it was just, as you say, a set up. Um, that was one example. I can think of another example when um, two senior Conservatives on opposite wings of the European debate. Uh, it was a Conservative Party conference and at the end of the conference we got them to uh, go into discussion with each other to reflect the depth of the divide. We could not get them, I could not get them to disagree about anything. They just were sweetness and light. And at the end of it, I said thank you both very much and as they wandered out, I heard one talk, uh, turn to the other and say, well, he didn't expect that, did he? And again, they, they played a game. You've written quite a lot in the book about war correspondence, and in particular the number of journalists who have died. Why did you focus on that? Ah, journalists have a very bad reputation. I mean, the cliché is that they are only marginally more popular than estate agents. I mean, they're always at the bottom of the list of professions that are well regarded by the public. And that's fine, I don't mind that. I don't think journalists need to be respectable. It's part of, part of their job not to be respectable. But uh, I worry sometimes that the impression is given that only war correspondents are the genuinely brave, courageous journalists who deserve all the awards going. I have the utmost admiration for war correspondents. I've done a little bit of myself and I know what's involved. But there are lots of other journalists, and I think particularly investigative journalists, who do a really tough job, sometimes months and months of investigation, and they don't always get the credit that they are due for. I sometimes say to people, if there weren't journalists, think of the things we wouldn't know about the world we live in. We wouldn't know that until quite recently MPs routinely fiddled their expenses. We wouldn't know that until quite recently multinational corporations didn't pay their taxes. We wouldn't know that the senior levels of sport were riddled with corruption. We wouldn't know that international cycling was riddled with drug taking. And it goes on and on and on. All of these things were revealed by journalists doing their job. And I would like more people to recognise that. You've been a reporter and a presenter, but you've also been a news editor at The Observer, and you were responsible for employing David Lee, one of the great investigative journalists, and you ran a whole series of stories about Mark Thatcher and his dodgy business dealings. Tell us about that. It was, it was a very interesting example of how difficult it sometimes is to see who is doing what and why. These stories about Mark Thatcher had been running in The Observer for several weeks and quite clearly were enraging Margaret Thatcher, then the Prime Minister, and her press spokesman Bernard Ingham. And then out of the blue I got a phone call from a man whom I had known some years previously when I was covering the Margaret Thatcher election campaign in 1979. He was one of her press officers at the time. Oh Robin, it says it's been ages we haven't spoken for such a long time. Why don't we have lunch and catch up? Fine, let's have lunch and catch up. So we had lunch and it was all very pleasant and we chatted and we gossiped and it was all right. It was only till we, when we got to the coffee, right at the end of the lunch, that he said, one thing I wanted to ask you, what would it take to get the observer to lay off Mark? And I suddenly thought, OK, now I know why I'm being bought lunch. And I said, uh, well, I think if he sat down and gave us an on-the-record interview and answered all of our questions, then that might bring the series of stories to an end. OK, he said, fine, I'll, uh, I'll relay that back. What I didn't know was that he was working at the time for Tim Bell, who was, in turn, unofficially, working for the Thatchers to try and uh, represent Mark's interests. Needless to say, we didn't get the interview with Mark Thatcher, but another newspaper did, and uh, he stopped. You look back on a career over 30, 40 years, and... Do you take the view that journalism has gone to pot, that it was so much better in the old days? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I think there are huge problems about the business of journalism because fewer and fewer people are buying newspapers, fewer and fewer people are prepared to pay for journalism. They think it all somehow drifts into their laps without anybody spending any money. 
But there are some amazingly good journalists around. I, I don't subscribe to the view that uh, the glorious days of Fleet Street are now dead and gone. They weren't all that glorious. I mean, Fleet Street was a pretty ramshackle, vulgar, nasty place in which women had no role, in which alcohol was abused routinely. Um, it had a sort of seedy Soho-like glamour, um, but I don't, I don't kind of romanticise it in any way. I think in many ways journalism is in as robust a health, if people are prepared to pay for the journalism, as it has ever been. But I do worry about the lack of money. I worry particularly about the future of the BBC, which is under continuing and growing threat. Newspapers, I won't say they're dying, but they are struggling. Meanwhile, the new media organisations uh, have a different attitude towards what is good journalism and what is not good journalism. And there is the growth of what we now know as fake news. I was going to ask you about that. What, what, how much harder does that make the life of journalists, do you think? I think very much harder. I gave a talk a couple of days ago at a uh, school and I was talking to a group of very interested and interesting sixth formers. And I said to them, where do you get your news from? And they all said, Facebook. And I said to them, how do you know that what you read on Facebook is true and how do you judge whether or not it's true or fake? And they looked at me a bit blankly because it wasn't really a question they asked. They just read it on Facebook. And we now know that in America, at least in the run-up to the presidential election campaign, more fake news stories were shared on Facebook than true news stories. And that is a real, real worry. I think now Facebook is beginning to understand that it has a responsibility to do something about that. But until recently, it just said, oh, we, you know, we're just a platform. It's not up to us what people put. So you've finished your full-time career, at any rate, with the BBC, and you've written the book. What next? <sighs> I'm enjoying myself doing other things. Um, the nice thing about not having a day job is that you don't have to do the things you don't enjoy anymore. I just do things I do enjoy. So I blog and I turn up in studios when people ask me to and I can have opinions again. That's one of the things I love. One of the great problems, it's not really a problem, but it was a restriction of being a BBC presenter, is you are not allowed to have an opinion. Not in public, anyway. And the only way I could be sure not to voice an opinion in public was not even to have an opinion in private. Um, I think it was Andrew Marr, wasn't it, who said that when you join the BBC, you have your opinions surgically removed. And I do remember very clearly when I left the BBC after presenting my last programme, feeling a little bit as if I'd been released from a prison. I could suddenly start saying what I thought. And uh, I quite enjoy being a bit outrageous and a bit provocative. And all that bit of me now is being given full opportunity on my blog and elsewhere to say what I think. <laughs>